Um, thank you. And um, there will be an opportunity to um, ask some questions after the fact. Um, so, so thank you all for coming here today. Um, I just want to thank you for, you know, going through the virtual format, um, especially in these times where uh, social distancing and uh, communal gathering is a little bit more challenging. Um, so today here we are virtually sitting in on a panel for tonight it is the collective inquiries exploring landscape through diverse art practices. Um, and our artist panel for today is Leah Weinstein. Oh my gosh, yeah, Weinstein and Annie Biard, Dr. Prophecy's son, Melanie Nugent Noble, and Tara Nicholson, uh, where they will be discussing their artistic practice, uh, ways of making with the land, and collaborative research techniques. All right. And um, as we are gathered here today at Lake Country Art Gallery at Kelowna, BC and the surrounding areas, we are very grateful to do what we love on the unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. I am Michaela Bridgmahan, the moderator for today, and I am also occupying on the Silks land. And I am originally from Tree Seven Territory, that is the traditional and ancestral home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes Kanani, Pekani, and Sisika, as well as the Sioux Tina Nation and Stony Nakoda First Nation. Um, a few of our guests are located on the Musqueam and Squamish territories as well. Um, we just want to also acknowledge the many First Nation Métis and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for a time immemorable. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and the elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Um, so just take a time if you need any uh, help knowing your territory, I very much welcome you to privately or message me and I can provide a link where you can see the different sorts of Indigenous folks who live here in Canada and Turtle, Turtle Island and across other countries as well around the planet. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our five panelists for today. Um, and they will be sharing their micro residency experience at Lake Country Art House this summer, uh, which was also in conjunction with the Rotary Center for the Arts. Um, so please take the time to mute your mics. Uh, we did leave the chat open, so uh, feel free to pop in any responses as our presenters will um, show their work. Um, positivity is great, enthusiasm is great, we'll be here watching the chat and we will communicate with you. Um, again, there will be a time to answer and ask some questions at the end and hopefully facilitate some really interesting uh, discussions. Uh, so first I'm just going to go through our uh, panelists artist statements and then we can begin. So uh, Leah Weinstein is a Vancouver-based artist whose practice investigates connections between material culture and social ideals of a larger collective, using everyday objects and ready-made materials to create sculpture, textiles, and performance. Leah examines relationships between individuals and collectives, subjects and objects, action and display. Uh, her work has been supported by the BC Arts Council, the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation, the BAM Center, Touchstones, Nielsen Museum of Art and History, uh, and the uh, Charles H. Scott uh, Gallery and the City of Richmond Public Art Commissions. Her professional experience includes designing co costumes. I am a cosplayer, so I love that. Uh, I can really bond with that. Um, for contemporary the uh, theater and dance companies, and she completed her Master of Fine Arts from Emily Carr University in 2014. So thank you, Aaliyah, for being here. Um, next on the board is Annie Biard. She is a Canadian photography and media artist whose work challenges how we sense the world through visual perception, uh, creating lens based and light fo focused work. She explores the intersections between perception paradigms and psychology, neuroscience, and existentialism. Her moving images, media installations, and expanded and print photography works have been presented in numerous solo exhibitions, including within the Eclipse at the Burrard Arts Foundation, Second Sight at AC Institute, Sight Shifting at Joyce Yohada Gallery, 
um, that's in Montreal, as well as group shows, festivals, and fairs internationally, including at the Vancouver Art Gallery at Art Mer, that's awesome, Three Shadows Photography Center, and the Lincoln Film Center, New York. Um, she regularly undertakes art residencies, including have uh, working in New York, Los Angeles, Spain, Iceland, as well as long haul hikes across North America, backcountry. Uh, Annie Virard's work has received support from the Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, and the Social Science and Humanities Research. Oh, you got the SHIRK at SHIRK, um, <laughs> it's the Research Council of Canada. Uh, I, I tend to uh, think out loud, uh, so <laughs> apologies as I'm reading this, your works and my responses. Um, Gerard is currently a faculty at the Emily Carr University of Art and Design, and her artistic research has been presented at universities, conferences, and art institutions across Canada, including Concordia University, Queen's University as well. In conjunction with her practice, she occasionally curates exhibitions and public programs in relation to her research interests. So thank you for being here, Annie. We're very happy for you to be here, and I'm super excited to see your work. Um, next, we have Dr. Prophecy Sun. Uh, she is a interdisciplinary performance, queer movement, video, and sound maker, a mother, and a current Jack and Doris Shadbolt Fellow at the Simon Fraser University. Her practice uh, celebrates both conscious and unconscious moments and the vulnerable spaces of the in-between in which art, performance, and life overlap. Uh, the liminality of that, I love that. Her recent research has focused on eco-feminist perspectives, co-composer, uh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, composing with voice, objects, surveillance, technologies, and site-specific engagements along the Columbian Basin region and beyond. Sun hosts tapes and beyond at Kootenai Co-op Radio and is the arts editor of the Ecoscene. And she performs and exhibits regularly in local, national, and international settings, music festivals, conferences, and galleries, and has authored several peer reviewed articles and book chapters and journal publications. Wow. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, uh, Prophecy, for being here. Um, we have Melody Nugent Noble. Um, she is a interdisciplinary artist currently based in Kelowna, BC. She is interested in connecting with objects, spaces, and people, and her work regularly engages around themes of social inclusion, both through installations that bring people together and activate community gathering spaces. That's beautiful. And through works that explore the ways for residents to connect with others that may not typically cross paths in their day-to-day -day lives and routines. Nugent's Noble's work responds to the political and social nature of public spaces and takes various forms, including community-focused installations and art books made from public government documents and speeches. Oh, Melanie Nugent Noble has a formal background in digital arts and media communications and has an MFA at the Emily Carr University of Art and Design 2015. Since then, um, she has been building her artistic practice with the support of the BC Arts Council, including the Early Career Development Grant in 2016 uh, and the Visual Arts Grant in 2018, supported by the uh, Canadian Arts uh, Council. And participation in residencies include the Banff Arts Center creatively uh, and the art and law program in New York. Oh, cool. In 2020, she was the city's uh, city of Kelowna's inaugural artist and residence to develop the project when it was necessary to stand still. I think I've seen that work, Melanie. That was awesome. Uh, thank you for being here. And I can't wait to hear more about your uh, process. Um, last but not least, Tara Nicholson. Um, so Tara incorporates photography and installation within her research. She has traveled throughout the Arctic to document climatology, sometimes with a blurred line between sci-fi and actual science. Oh, that's so good. Um, she has exhibited internationally recently at the Arts Gallery of Victoria and the Modern Fuel Artist Run Center and the Oxygen Art Center. Uh, attending residencies include Earth and the BAM Center. Um, and then there's a German word, which I'm going to butcher, the Consular House, uh, Dormund, and apologies, and the Emperor of Dirt Residency in Creston, BC. And hello, thank you for uh, 
joining us today, uh, Emperor. <laughs> and uh, Nicholson also teaches at the University of Victoria. She holds a degree from Riser University, so BFA, and Concordia University, where she received her MFA. Um, she also has ongoing uh, funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and BC Arts Council in 2020. Uh, in 2020, oh my gosh, Nicholson embarked on her PhD at the UBC Okanagan to produce a body of exploratory work of landscape studies linking escalating changes with the Anthropocene and documenting rewilding and extinction studies while witnessing waves of Indigenous and settler allied land activism. Uh, she is exploring the role of art within activism and how the interpretation of climate action can affect this outcome. That is awesome. I am super excited to hear all of you. Uh, thank you for being here. And what a um, what a CV. We're like sitting here with such knowledgeable women and so powerful. And I'm just so excited to be here with these energies and to bear witness to your work. Um, so just a quick recap. I was at the um, Lake Country Art Gallery student, um, gallery assistant, and I got to somewhat get a peek at this micro residency. And um, it was just such a very uh, interesting experience. And Petrina, do you have any comments about that experience as well? Um, no, <laughs> all good. Um, I'm just super excited to be somewhat related to this and I cannot wait to watch what you guys have done together. So let's welcome everyone and uh, let's come here and uh, again, mute your mics and let's watch and bear witness and chat is open, feel free. Thank you, Leah, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela, so much. What an enthusiastic introduction. I so appreciate. Um, I didn't know you were going to read our bios, but that was wonderful to just be reminded of, wow, these women have been doing a ton. And I just feel so honored to be in, you know, in the presence of, of, of all of you. So yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go first um, as one of the organizers of the micro-residency. So I'm just gonna share my screen and show a few images. My, I think my talk is about nine minutes long. Um, I wrote it so that I would, you know, wouldn't kind of go off the rails as you know, I can sometimes do and just kind of stay on track with what I wanna share with you guys. So I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. And um, yeah, so I'm just gonna to talk to a few of these images. So. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and, and also to thank, thank you to Lake Country Art Gallery and Petrina for hosting us and to Rotary Center of the Arts in Kelowna for hosting us as well. Um, so before I get into the micro residency, I want to start with a super quick intro to my art practice. I'm just going to share three images, um, and how they relate to the micro residencies as sort of the thinking behind you know, why micro residencies? So um, my background is in sculpture and often sculpture is thought of as a static form. But the question I was asking early on in my practice was how can sculpture be mobile and act as an interface between the body and the landscape? And furthermore, how can sculpture shape the relational or social experiences of the viewing audience or participating audience and act as an interface as well between the individual and the collective. So, so this early work is a multi-person garment um, that creates, oh wait, is my screen really tiny here? Let me make this a little bigger so you can see. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, so this uh, multi-person garment was also a tent and it was a shelter form as well as a garment. And it was really exploring how the participants were uh, required to negotiate with one another in order to move around and experience the artwork. So this is an early example of my interest in non-hierarchical relationships between participants and early explorations into relationships between the individual and the collective, which is what the micro-residencies kind of continue to explore. Uh, so, Another question was, how does the individual 
individual negotiate within the larger collective and um and what happens when that uh when when that form presents challenges or difficulties in negotiating how to work together as in this um this other multi-person garment which functions both as a sculpture and as a performance or a container to explore in a very embodied way the challenges of working together in a collective um, a third artwork that I want to share really quickly, um, commissioned by Public Art Richmond in 2013, continues exploring these ideas, but this time expanding outward into a shelter form, so beyond the garment into more of a, a container that also breaks into individual pieces. And in this piece, 10 performers carried 10 individual parts across three specific sites before constructing the collective whole shelter and inviting incidental passers-by into the sculpture shelter farm. And it was a very utopian gesture, the idea of welcoming people into this literal bubble. Um, but I was really interested in the, the utopian side of that, as well as the, the problems that are, that are created through this utopian gesture. So this you know, segues into this other type of shelter form. So meanwhile, in, in 2010, I had purchased an old school bus and converted it into a mobile studio space. Um, this is a photo of my dad helping me take the seats out of the school bus to, to create this open space. And after about six years of using it as a sculpture studio, it occurred to me that the bus itself would make an amazing ready-made version of a mobile shelter form. And I became curious about what that would look like as an artist run gallery. So in 2016, with the help of a BC Arts Council mentorship grant, mentoring with Vancouver based artist Laiwan, I created Site Factory as a mobile art gallery. And the goal with this project was to bring art exhibitions, performances, and artist conversations to unconventional sites around Vancouver. And um, and really the goal was to explore a range of site specific locations through this roaming venue, while also exploring the agency of the artists. And the, the question I was asking here was, how can we explore this artist run gallery space in again in a non hierarchical way where the artists get to choose what and where and how they share their work. It was it was a really exciting project I hosted um, 13 different exhibitions and performances altogether. And this is, is where I started working with Prophecy Son and Annie, who, you know, as, as you know, are here today with us and I'm still working with. And it was also the start of my friendships with both of them. It started with, you know, me inviting them to do a project and then we just became friends with all of our shared interests and as artists and um, yeah, art explorers. Uh, this is Annie's project. Um, so the social fabric we created became part of the project as well, and these experiences with Site Factory furthered my interest in art as a social experience, really looking into social practice, exploring and creating community, asking the question, how can we organize together? And what would art events look like if they were organized by artists rather than relying on larger institutions to organize us, although we did partner with art galleries and other art organizations through Site Factory. And this is Lime One's project with guest artists, C. Swice and Ann Riley. Um, it was still in, a, in this, with this non-hierarchical focus where we were organizing together as partners rather than com being com more on the terms of the institutions. Um, okay, so this brings us to the micro-residencies. So, in 2018, I felt complete with the bus and I sold it. I had it for eight years. I ran it as a gallery for two and a half years and I decided to move on to other projects. But along with the sculptural work, I really wanted to continue exploring the theme of these you know, artist run, artist organized modes of organizing and gathering together. So I began exploring the idea of facilitating artist residencies and this is, when Annie and I started talking about this together and we created the first micro residency together. So this is the first one we hosted, facilitated, I should say, on Bowen Island. So here, Scott Massey and Maggie Wong joined Annie and I 
and Scott hosted us at his gallery on Bowen Island, Terminal Creek Contemporary, and Scott also joined us in Kelowna. And this was an amazing weekend of experimentation and connection. It was open and organic with a focus on creating a flexible collective container for ourselves for the weekend. And this way of working together was really appealing to us. So we decided, you know, af after this weekend, we decided to do it again this summer in, in Kelowna. And after that first year of the pandemic, we were all really ready to meet with other artists again. And um, we waited until we were all fully vaccinated and then started reaching out to other artists to see who might be able to join us. This is Annie and I were, you know, organizing this at first. So we chose Kelowna and I reached out to Melanie um, and she was very enthusiastic and about joining us and got right on board and helped us organize and, and we stayed at her home and really she really welcomed us in. So thank you, Melanie, so much for that. Um, and, and then between the three of us, Annie, Melanie and myself, we invited the other participants, Tara Nicholson, Prophecy Sun, Scott Massey and Andreas Rutkowskis. And Scott and Andreas were unfortunately busy uh, tonight, so they weren't able to make it, but the five, um, five of the seven of us are, are here today, tonight. And so we identified with the help of Melanie two hosting venues for us to meet. On the first day of the residency, we met at the Rotary Center for the Arts in Kelowna. And then on the second day, we met at Lake Country Gallery. And many of you will recognize the art house here at Lake Country. And this is Scott Massey. So the idea behind the residency, continuing on from the Bowen residency, was to continue kind of exploring the container of the you know artist run artist organized residency and include as much input from the other artists as possible so that the artists could have as much agency within that space as they needed to present their work or questions or or experiments um, in some cases it was more of a polished presentation in in other cases, it was a series of questions followed by a conversation or a creative experiment. Here, Tara is cooking a delicious meal for us. Um, and I think we all felt like travelers in this sort of desert of isolation from COVID over this you know, year and a half of the pandemic. And so it was such, I think for all of us, it really felt like this oasis, meet, being able to meet together. We, you know, we were masked and, and we kept the doors open. We were all very careful. Um, but it was a real delight to be able to meet together again, but not only because of COVID, but also because of the kinship and feeling of empowerment and connection as artists to meet together with other artists and, and really just have it be completely on our own terms. Although we were supported very gratefully, um, you know, supported by Lake Country and um, Rotary Center. So, but the through this residency, I think we all really felt the value of sharing time together. And what I love about building art, art communities and artistic communities, gathering together as artists in whatever ways we can, whether it's on Zoom or in person, is these kinds of grassroots, artist-led ways that can create connection and conversation. And I think they're really valuable for reminding us of the ways that we're powerful and can create productive connections together. So that's, that's, my, that's my share. I'm just gonna stop my share. And uh, yeah, thank you all. I look forward to hearing whoever is gonna go next. It's um, pretty interesting just seeing that um, the photos that you put up in uh, Lake Country Art House and talking about the, you know, the precautions of making art um, and collaborating, it almost felt like a forbidden act. I felt like I was glimpsing, like you're so desperately want to collaborate, but then at the same time, it, it's like, is this allowed? And just pushing through that, that was awesome. It's, thank you, Leah, it was great. So if we could have our next presenter, um, maybe Melanie. I'm feeling Melanie right now. Sure, let's ah. do it. <laughs> awesome. Um, awesome. Thank, thank you everyone for being here. I'm just going to um, share as well, get everything kind of ready here. Share screen. Sure. 
share. All right. So I'll put this in presentation mode. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm Melanie Nugent Noble. I'm based in Kelowna, BC. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about work that's emerged out of uh, the project that uh, was mentioned earlier that I did for the city of Kelowna. Um, uh, it's something that I've been working on developing the technology and such for quite a few years now. I started it, I came up with the idea when I was doing my um, graduate studies at Emily Carr and it's evolved since then. And it included really developing a series of beacons that communicate over cellular um, network. And um, when they are closer in proximity, they get brighter to each other and change color. And when they're further apart, they become dimmer. And so based on the different colors that they are, um, you can really um, tell who's around you. And it's a different way to really think about connection and how do we form connections um, and articulate those connections in different ways um, with folks who we wouldn't really connect with through our day-to-day -day routines. So it's really about strangers. <laughs> it's also very much um, a game in a way as well. So um, it allows people to kind of, um, games and idea of a play of, of play uh, allow people to do like uh, rearrange the boundaries that they would normally have in their daily life and do things that they wouldn't do in a normal context, including interacting with strangers in different ways. So um, I did a series of activations um, after building the beacons and this is an actual, oh, sorry. That was a video from a participant named Brian McKenzie who took his beacon around um, in his car with him and did this time-lapse video. And it really just, he was going out trying to trigger different connections with folks. And it was really lovely just seeing this and other examples of how people connected with um, each other. Um, and then the data that was created on the other side of this is really where I've been focusing my time and energy in the last uh, few months. Um, with uh, support from the BC Arts Council, I got a pivot grant to really look at and center data on my practice. And I've been working um, on collaborating with a few different artists um, and uh, Petrina knows a little bit about this, but um, I was working with the data from the activations that were created in the city of, um, you know, GPS information and timestamp time data. So the beacons were at this location for this long and then moved here and how they all intersected and engaged and how do you kind of present that information in a different or abstracted way. Um, and there's a data management graduate student who reached out to me named Aditya Sulia. Um, and he's been uh, creating all these beautiful graphics out of the data um, that was provided. So um, yeah, it was really just kind of thinking about um, a different way of looking away around um, movement and how people um, abstracting, you know, in a, in a different way, this is a map of movements and a different ty type of landscape in a way of how people use the space and moved around Kelowna. So this is one of the tests that I just wanted to share. Um, and this was a collaboration. Um, this is another one um, that he did. And um, I also have a short little uh, screenshot animation that kind of shows how it, um, how it was built. Um, yeah. so really my, you know, this work has a bunch of different um, branches that are being explored. You know, at first it was really about connecting folks. Now it's a lot more about um, data and different ways of looking at the information that we generate and what does it mean as we move around and um, connect with people um, in you know, different, different spaces and, and think about it in different ways. Um, yeah, so I know I'm keeping this short, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, next, next. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and then just sharing another kind of thing that I've been doing um, just kind of in my COVID kind of project. Um, I do work with resin a fair amount as well. Um, 
And so just following kind of like the form of the, the beacons were dodecahedrons, I've started making these like colorful balls of resin um, in the shape of dodecahedrons. And it's really been just like, it takes a long time to make these. So it's been a very kind of meditative process that is kind of a different direction that um, has emerged from the original project, which I, you know, a couple of years ago, I never would have thought I'd be doing anything like this, but here we are. Um, and that's, you know, more of a personal kind of more than a community thing, but it, it's definitely a meditative kind of personal uh, COVID thing I've been doing. Um, I am going to be showing the uh, beacons coming up here again uh, at Eye Level Gallery in Halifax, which is another, um, it's an artist run center, uh, which is an interesting space because they don't actually have a gallery and they uh, really just focus on socially engaged artistic practices outside of the traditional white wall gallery. So things that do take place on the land or within the community. Um, so super excited about that. That's coming up on October 16th. Um, if anyone is going to be in Halifax, it'd be great to share it with you. Um, if not, I am going to be giving an artist talk on October 14th, um, which I think is like the Wednesday. Um, and it's going to be at the wave uh, is where I'm going to be in Halifax. I have never been to Halifax. Um, but I guess this is right at the harbor. It should be um, a lot of fun, I guess. I'm going to definitely try and climb that, take some photos up there, conquer the wave. Um, yeah, so uh, that's kind of what I've been working on. It's really just been a continuation of the data, looking at, looking at it and representing it in different ways and continuing uh, to bring the project to different communities and a different context of how folks move around the space, a different timing where the um, activation with the city of Kelowna was done. I think of it as slow art. It was over a few months with multiple participants who had beacons for about three days each. This is going to be a lot of participants um, over six hours switching off beacons um, and within a smaller, more confined, uh, like two kilometer radius, opposed to a citywide um, uh, experience. So I'm very interested in how, how changing the context of interaction through the time timing and then um, the boundaries that people have with the beacons will change how, what the data looks like and what the engagement looks like what looks like. I expect it's going to be a lot more playful um, and even having less restrictions because of COVID um, as well. So that's just kind of a brief overview and um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Melanie. It's interesting because that wave, the act of like the kids climbing upon it, it just makes me think of like so much potential of interaction. And it's so unpredictable to like how that space, occupying the space on that wave will be predicted. It's almost unpredictable because of COVID. Um, so I would love to see uh, the documentation of that once it's installed. That's, that's crazy in the responses. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'm super yeah. excited too. So yeah, it's going to be fun. So, and I just, you know, it's uh, as much as things have progressed with my practice in a way it's, ex it's expanding, but it really has to start to narrow around this one kind of project. So it's almost like mm -hmm. it's gone through a, an hourglass where it's been focused and now it's expanding in all these different areas. And I'm really excited because this is all like brand, brand spanking new to me too. So Totally. That's kind of, yeah, that kind of reminds me of how like um, famous artists become. That's when they start really honing in into their work and finding where it just fits perfectly um, into that small space. Uh, very exciting stuff. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and uh, that was beautiful. I'm super excited to see what Annie has. Um, if Annie would like to present next, that would be awesome. Sure, I can do that. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Melanie. I loved seeing kind of 
it's funny because we got to spend, I guess, a, a whole weekend together, like learning about more about each other's work. But uh, I feel like I, I just got uh, an even, yeah, sharper picture. So thanks for that. Um, okay, let me see about sharing this. Um, oh, sorry, I just booted you out. Okay. No, sorry, I forgot to stop sharing. <laughs> okay. Um, right on. Yeah, I um, also just wanted to thank Leah for her talk. I didn't realize that you had taken, there were all these like surreptitious, I guess, photos of different moments. And I've just been going down memory lane. I feel like I'm, yeah, just in this wave of, uh, yeah, these these positive moments that we've had. So I appreciate that. Okay, uh, I'm going to share this. Let me know if you can't see it. Or if it's, like, big enough. I think I did something weird with my screen where I'm, like, splitting everything. Um Okay, do you see it full screen now? Um, it went uh, blue. It's like, I see the blue. blue lines, but before it was pretty big, yeah. Okay, let me try again. One okay. more time. Nice, looks good. Okay, awesome, thanks. Um, so let me just put a timer on so I don't talk too long. Um, all right. So, yeah, I, I wanted to, I, I think Leah really uh, did a great job of kind of talking about the, the ethos of the, the micro residency projects and what it is that we kind of uh, hope to achieve and, and aim for. But one of the other bits that I uh, thought I would mention is how um, access is, is something that in a way like this whole pandemic started really highlighting the, um, the opportunities for increased access and how oftentimes residencies and opportunities for kind of collectivity with uh, among artists are really kind of, there, there are a number of limitations. So I, um, I just had a baby, I guess he just turned one uh, pandemic, pandemic baby. And, uh, and that was one thing, right, was kind of like, okay, there's a pandemic, how can I manage to attend this thing? And in the end, uh, I attended everything virtually. And it just kind of highlighted for me, uh, yeah, the ways in which um, access, I think, you know, for a number of different folks, but in particular, also for uh, mothers and, and other folks in caregiving roles, is sometimes very difficult. Um, so yeah, that's something that I think we can continue working on, uh, but that I appreciated all of you kind of making that space for me. So, okay, we're talking about landscape today, I think. So I don't really think of my work as necessarily being focused around landscape. And then um, in Victoria, uh, Deluge Art Contemporary asked me to do a show uh, this spring, and they wanted me to focus exclusively kind of on my landscape work and then I started digging through my archive and realizing like oh no Annie like you, you kind of are a landscape artist or at least it's something that ends up really coming through in my work a lot but I think that the way that I use it is to tackle issues in perception and our understanding of reality and our, our kind of relationships um, with each other so I'll share a couple of projects and then uh, before I and I want to talk about a couple of maybe larger picture ideas and a couple of references, uh, just some things that uh, I was able to kind of think about and continue working on after the residency. Um, so early on, the work that I was doing with the landscape uh, really were kind of about capturing um, a sense of affect or a certain moment with uh, the landscape. Um, so this is kind of one, one example, and I'll kind of scroll through it because otherwise you're going to think that you're looking at a still image. But this is one of the things, I guess, that I, I like to do with my work is really challenge the traditional 
landscape imagery, I guess, or uh, painting or photography and really kind of put it through its paces and change how we're seeing it. So this is an example of, um, of a scene uh, that was really effective for me because it's it's a trail that uh, it's called Angel's Landing. I don't know if any of you have done that, uh, but it's out in Utah. And basically, there's like this thin, thin, thin strip of land that you have to manage to kind of crawl over without falling into the precipice in order to make it through, I guess, and get to the end of the trail. And what I was looking at here was just the ways in which uh, light can really alter our understanding of place and of how the landscape is shaped and then sort of the issues that come up within photography and also visual perception, um, the, the fallacies that come up. So this is just me basically um, kind of haphazardly selecting certain, certain parts of the mountain and shifting the light as if the sunlight could maybe have, um, yeah, a different kind of agency here. So that's one example. and. Another one are, I guess it's not super effective to show you this series because I can't, normally I would hand out 3D glasses and now I can't. So you're going to have to just take my word for it that these are really awesome 3D images. Uh, no, but basically the idea here was to, um, to kind of push the 3D aspect so that the photograph itself could actually become almost more uh, palpably real than, uh, than it would have felt like to be physically there. So they're very, very pushed, and when you watch them, you almost feel like there's that precipice or there's really that stacking uh, that's going on. And then I guess from there, those are just a couple of, like, yeah, still examples I wanted to show you. But more recently, one of the works that uh, Michaela was mentioning when she was very kindly uh, reading out my bio, thank you for that, was this piece Second Sight. So I'm just going to play a short clip of this for you, and then I'll, I'll get into some of those yeah, topics I was, I was mentioning. It's a minute long. Okay, uh, so that maybe gives you a little bit of an idea of that piece. What's going on? Okay, yeah, so what, what I'm really interested in is how, um, how we can kind of explore the failings of our perception and how that opens up so much more uh, about our understanding and opportunities for um, you know, learning from the land for spirituality, uh, but also for understanding kind of uh, vision or sight beyond uh, physical experience or beyond what we think is there. And so I play a lot with optical illusions and with deconstructing how the eye works. So in this case, I'm almost um, reversing the visual process where our eye brings together, our, our um, perceptual system brings together uh, three different colors, red, green, and blue, to then create the entire universe that we see around us. And um, in this case, I'm kind of almost uh, laying that bare. Okay, I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm not going to show you more work, but I'm maybe going to get out of my uh, share screen.
and um, maybe share just a couple of references with you. So one of the things that I was thinking about during the residency in Kelowna, all of the fires were happening, uh, you know, the, the pandemic was going on, which I really felt was kind of nature's response to uh, a lot of things. And so I was really questioning my role and, and inviting everybody to help me kind of think through uh, my relationship to, I guess, my practice and how my practice is uh, maybe affecting or participating in, you know, the larger ecosystem and, and the environment and what's going on. And I think in particular, as a video person and as a photographer, there are all of these chemicals that are used. There's so much of that that's, that's coming into play. So there was a lot of thinking about that. Um, I don't think I'll have time to get into a whole summary of what we did discuss. I'm happy to share some of the kind of almost solutions. I felt like we were starting to go places, uh, which, which was exciting to me. One of the responses was, um, by one of the guys in the group. I don't know if that matters. I don't know if, if like sometimes ethics around the environment can be maybe gendered or privileged or I don't know. I feel like this could we could take this conversation different places. Um, but some of the things that were mentioned were sort of like what happens when humans leave and what happens when uh, space can be kind of rewilded or brought back to nature. So I wanted to share this book that I started reading, um, I guess, right after the residency, uh, that the residency kind of, yeah, brought me to. Um, and this basically talks about, uh, I can share, I can share links afterwards, but this basically talks about how, um, yeah, nature kind of sort of restabilizes itself or finds a way through after we've left. So some examples, of course, include like the salt and sea as now a refuge for birds, even though it's like, you know, a sea made of death and, and crushed bones. Um, another argument that had been made, and so another book that I wanted to share with you is uh, uh, Lorraine Daston, working out of MIT, and she's basically arguing for some of the ways in which we kind of see uh, nature as being the, the supreme ethical system and whether that, you know, should really be accurate or not or how humans, I guess, connect to that. So those are kind of some perspectives. I still feel like I need to make, I still feel very conflicted with my relationship. Um, I'm going to do a plug. I'm going to be really cheesy and I'm going to do a plug for an art magazine and myself at the same time because I'm just in, I don't know, I'm just gross tonight. Um, but because there's been the news of Canadian art totally folding, I think it's super important that we all go and subscribe to all of the art magazines so that we can continue art magazines in Canada. So this is one, um, this is Photo Ad Magazine. One of my landscape pieces happens to be on the cover, so that's why I have it here to show you. Um, I told you it was going to be a disgusting uh, plug. But the reason why I wanted to show it to you is that there's an article in here that I think all photographers, I'm going to share it with all of my students and all of you, um, is basically Verdant Luminol is this new technique that some photographers have discovered uh, that replaces the chemical process in photo making by using coffee and biodegradable organic materials. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then I think, I think one of my students is here or was here who we were talking about, um, are you still here? We were talking about anthotypes and uh, she, I, no, I think she left, unfortunately. Um, but we were talking about anthotypes, and she actually just went and did some amazing um, tests with that, which is basically printing from uh, vegetables and found materials. So, okay, I'm going to be quiet now because I think I, I went over my time, but just a few little nuggets of things that I've been thinking about that hopefully are helpful for you too. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Annie. Don't feel rushed. It's very uh, captivating. And I think you have like a lot of these super interesting nuggets of um, important questions that I definitely have for you at the end of this for sure. Um, but 
like just thinking about the personal level of your work and viewing it, especially like your moment of seeing and like seeing work is so uh, vital to part of the experience of artwork, unfortunately, and just thinking about that way of access um, and privilege of having sight. Um, and also one of your moving pieces to that video piece with the I'm hearing uh, like the, the singing bell uh, bowls and uh, the transitions between um, spaces. And there's like this warpness to it that kind of reminds me of experiencing a migraine and how migraines are, sort of like activate um, my space around me very differently visually and like through senses. So I just really connected with that piece. Thank you. <laughs> really. Yeah, the ocular migraine. I hadn't thought of that, but you're yeah. right. It looks exactly like that. Yeah. It does. It's kind of like uh, I was thinking about when I was reading your all of your bios, and every time I came up with 2020, there's like this sort of like trauma informed reaction. Like I kind of didn't want to say 2020. Um, that's kind of like my experience with that that piece too. Like the memory of a migraine. I'm like oh my god oh wait Michaela it's a video you're good um, <laughs> uh, it's interesting how artwork can really Im impact you in that sort of uh, sensational way uh, thank you thank you again um, I think we have two more Prophecy and Tara if anyone wants to go first well, unless you want me to call you out um, <laughs> yeah call you okay Prophecy you're right next to me on my little screen <laughs> Yeah, that's, Tara, that's okay. You can round it up on the corner, which is good. I actually think um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, a having me here, um, and thank you to um, thank you to Leah and Annie and Melanie for welcoming uh, me into um, something to me that was in it was my favorite experience of the whole summer. Speaking of wildfires and parenting and juggling and all the things in between uh and migraines and uh life and <laughs> it's a pretty big mixed bowl but I um completely thoroughly enjoyed the process of coming and doing a micro residency because I actually as a as a mother of two little ones and a working professional I just the amount of time to go somewhere unless there is childcare or other things associated, it's really difficult to make those moments possible. So I really appreciated the time and the space and thank you. And um, for those, I mean, that introduction was insane. Um, so thank you for that. It's really a, a pretty phenomenal um, group of artists to be situated and conversing with. So I feel very lucky and grateful. And um, I did prepare a presentation, but I feel like it's overkill at this point. Um, and so for me, um, I guess, you know, just there's threads between what I found is during the micro residency, I realized how many threads were between each of the artists and uh, that were there and so many connections. And um, I felt very moved by um, uh, just also this notion that Annie, you're bringing up, um, you know, at the very end here of your presentation about, you know, thinking about ecological, ecological, sustainable ways of working. And I think this is one of the threads that kind of came up um, in some of our discussions. And so um, over the last nine months, I just finished my Shadbolt Fellowship at SFU. So I feel very grateful to have just final, uh, finalized my project. Um, and so when I did the micro residency, I was really in a stage where I was just starting to um, kind of put together some of the pieces that I had been culminating and gathering over nine months. And so, um, you know, it's an interesting thing trying to um, uh, trying to organize, first of all, uh, just in general, I'm just gonna organize this here for a second while I get my screen organized. Boop, 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 boop. Let's do a stop share because I've stopped sharing everything. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to, um, to try and uh, do a residency and still be um, situated in, thinking about things in a deep way. And I think 
um, what for me was really engaging in this process. Um, just gonna hopefully no, that's just gonna keep showing my whole thing. Okay, good. Well, well that solves lots of that. Um, <laughs> um, what I found really intriguing for me was actually talking with everybody about their experiences listening to uh, a series of sound works that I was starting to compose. So I was going to play a couple of those um, for you tonight that have come to a place where I feel like I can move forward from them and let them go. Um, and they really do, um, there's these traces of of different landscapes. And so I, um, during the course of my residency, um, I'm calling it a residency, um, the micro residency, but with my Shadow Fellowship, I basically did a residency for nine months in three different locations in the Fraser Valley. And um, one of the things that came out of that that I thought was really um, interesting is I was really drawn to these marsh wetlands. And um, one was a bird sanctuary. Uh, the other was this walk where um, passerbys would uh, navigate. And then the third location was um, right by uh, the Delta uh, migratory ports where the, all the shipping containers that come into Vancouver and in the lower mainland they come there. And so there was this really, um, there's like these three different thresholds that I was navigating. And um, so I'm just going to play a couple of sound clips that I feel are, they touch on that. You can feel the traces of these landscapes and the migration that's happening in them. And also um, just thinking about um, just sort of these threads and these traces between all of our practices. And I, I think I'll leave it at there for now. But because of the fact that um, the work is so interdisciplinary, I'm just going to drop my um, website that you can actually look at um, some of the moving images and the video together because sometimes in this platform they don't get along as well. Um, so I'm just going to play you a couple of sounds in the meantime. Uh, just bear with me for a second here. Two. Um, All right, one moment. So the first piece is called Trains at Roberts Bank. Please let me know if you can hear it. One of the tracks it's so hard to stop once you start listening to sound to stop it um so uh again thinking about migration and space and um also thinking about uh colonial ideas of being in a landscape and feeling like i need to take something so i was really hesitant um about each of the locations i was at and also recording things in a way that um felt like 
I was amplifying what was there. So to kind of give voice to some of these sounds that um, kind of get lost in our everyday. Uh, the second one I'm going to play for you is called uh, Woodpecker. <laughs> and this is on the McNeely Trail. And I'm just going to play this now. So hard to stop things again. <laughs> um, another element of things that, um, you know, over the course of the nine months as well, I realized, and this seems to be a thread again throughout my practice, is also a meshing of time and space and thinking of um, things kind of collapsing into each other. And so during this walk where that there's a, there's there was a number of walks that are kind of folded into each other and layered and found. So you hear a woodpecker in there, um, people walking, but there's also these conversations that are kind of almost slown down and frozen and then elongated and stretched out. So again, it's this folding of time over each other. I'm gonna just play one last thing. And then um, if you have a moment to take a look at the website, you'll be able to see some visual elements as well. So the last one I'm gonna play is uh, the night swarm. And so uh, the third location was the bird sanctuary, which is right off of um, the ocean um, that comes in. And it's just beautiful. And one night when um, I was there, there was this whole, um, this just gigantic swarm of birds and the, the sanctuary was already closed, but I was trying to come at different hours to see what kind of movement was happening. So this is the last one I'm gonna play and then I'll pass it off. Yeah, it's so hard to stop when you're starting to play things that in this medium don't translate as well. However, um, if you get a chance, I'm just also going to drop the, um, the album in here if you'd like to listen to that at some point in your own time. Um, the pieces are very meditative. Um, they take time. And again, it's that folding of space and energy and migration and time all in one. Um, so I'm just going to stop my share here. And there we go. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. It's interesting to take like a moment of time just to stop and listen. Um, I was listening to a talk with Dr. Bonaventure and he talked about the sonic and like how uh, in order to see you need to like stop and actively listen. 
for that space. Um, and like, it was just really nice to actively do that on Zoom. <laughs> and it's interesting how it translates through uh, digital mechanics and um, thinking about authenticity or like interruptions. Uh, I wonder, Prophecy, do you know um, uh, Raven Chacon? Chacon? Yeah. No. Oh, oh my God. I need to send you some information about him. He's an indigenous um, artist that uses music and uh, the power of the voice that brings out the conjure of the spirit in the landscape. It's mm. just, I just think you guys would just really mesh really well. It's really interesting work there. Thank you, Prophecy. Thank you. And I, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to know that artist. I, yeah. But yeah. Thank, th thank you. And thank you for having me. And thank you again for, um, for uh, having me be part of this oh it's it's awesome super privileged <laughs> i love this this is great um and last but not least tara okay cool uh, i'm gonna finish up here and i'm gonna uh make this shorter and just keep track of time. Um, I did wanna say though, uh, a quick thank you to Leah and also to Annie. It did, as you, we were describing the residency at the beginning, um, almost feel really taboo. It felt like being back in art school or something that just sort of very privileged space of having a critique. And I had been really up North and literally had not even spent that much time thinking or, or talking about art or, or seeing it. And it was such a really unique environment. And um, it gave me a lot to think about. I'm um, hoping to co-curate a uh, residency with Marnie and Jim that are here tonight from the Empire of uh, Dirt residency. And it just, I've attended a lot of residencies and um, as several people said uh, this evening, it, it's really hard to, to leave your life and how do you make that happen with work and, and family. And um, I think there's different ways with the pandemic even that, um, I don't wanna say it's a silver lining, but just different ways that people are able to participate within things now. It's been a really positive thing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and I'm gonna really uh, rapid fire here through some images images really quickly and just kind of give you a quick overview of what I've been doing in the last um, little while here. Um, so I think for those of you that are at least a little bit familiar with my work, I've been photographing in the Arctic and sort of using the lens of um, climatology of, of sort of these rock star scientists as sort of a, a lens for that to really sort of activate uh, the landscape. And instead of just showing, you know, icebergs and beautiful images, I really wanted to show the Arctic as this really sort of active and obviously very uh, changing um, space. So I was very privileged, uh, again, through uh, grant funding. It's very incredibly expensive and, and difficult to get to the Arctic, but I was able to go to Greenland and then parts of the Canadian Arctic and um, Inuvik. And I really just started this sort of language of beginning to understand what the Arctic is even about and what climatology even looks like. And then um, I guess about a year before the pandemic, I went here to uh, Eastern Siberia to a place called the Northeast Science Station. Um, also, their research project, a rewilding project called Pleistocene Park. And it was at this place where things sort of kind of started to go in other directions. And I'm hopefully going back, <laughs> fingers crossed, in, in March. Um, so at this science station, which is also in the Arctic and the far uh, eastern area of Russia. They also have scientists that come from all over the world. There's this permafrost um, landscape. Also, as you can see here, a, a ton of uh, mosquitoes, but there's our, our, sorry, there's scientists that come from all over the world and they really are there to, to look at this really unique landscape, which honestly will not be there. And even 20 years from now, this is uh, exposed permafrost right here that you have in front of us and the scientists sort of like chipping it, it off and studying it in different ways. And then really sort of uh, parallel to that, there's places in Yakutsk, which is a little bit further south that I went. This is a, a research tunnel uh, that a lot of um, science studies have been done there since even sort of the 1920s at Permafrost Tunnel, looking at, again, at these different landscapes, even underground of, of permafrost. And then finally, where I'm really hoping to go back to here is this place, the scene park, where they are literally, it sounds almost like a Jurassic Park, but they are um, actually importing animals, even bison, 
camel, perhaps this uh, newly uh, cloned uh, woolly mammoth to really sort of rewild the space. And the idea uh, really in, in a nutshell is, is to take this, sorry, this landscape that was once sort of a tundra or shrub forest back to a grassland that existed in the mammoth steep um, time before the Holocene. And the grass is not only more uh, reflective, but the animals sort of compress and it actually is working. It's keeping the, the, the permafrost colder and this idea of sort of Arctic rewilding is definitely very um, controversial, but sort of these ideas between fact and fiction have really sort of fueled my imagination. And during the pandemic, I've taken these ideas further. There's a lot of, uh, because of the permafrost melting mammoth bones, and these are some ceramic works that I've done um, in Raku um, fire. When I started my PhD, I've started working in, in some ceramics there and sort of that idea of kind of on this, this play of fakes or what's real. And a lot of folks saw this idea of maybe, you know, mammoth uh, ivory sort of being a, a better alternative, but in the end, it's actually propping up the ivory, ivory uh, illegal ivory industry, which is obviously not very um, good. And even since I have not been back to the Arctic, I've been looking at a lot of these uh, scientific structures within the landscape, which to me honestly sometimes look more like sculpture. And I've learned a lot about science, but uh, sometimes these, these honestly do look more like a sculpture to me. And so I've started to kind of bring uh, these sort of scientific or quasi scientific sculptures uh, within the gallery here. I'm also using these really large cyanotypes, which is a, a really um, traditional traditional photographic process. So those are kind of some of the ways and very in progress. And even during the residency, I was discussing some of these new ways that I'm working. And then very quickly, I'm just gonna flick through these images just very quickly. This is kind of a, a body of work that I've kind of switched veins since I haven't been able to go to the Arctic. And I've been really looking at a lot of the activism around um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline and outside of perhaps uh, posters and marches, which are obviously very important in the streets. There's indigenous and settler actions that are happening right on the pipeline. And obviously this relates to my work with landscape, but I've been looking at these spaces like this longhouse that's built uh, really close to the Burn Me uh, terminal. This is, is literally the, the pipeline route itself. Um, a lot of these uh, Camp Cloud places have already been destroyed at the uh, Burnaby um, Terminal, but I was really interested in sort of this, this very ephemeral way and really wanting to, to document a lot of this sort of uh, landscape and, and again this way to sort of activate this landscape and, and something that I feel really needs to be documented. So for a few times now I've been to the site which is near um, Blue River sort of in the very middle of BC uh, a couple hours I guess from Prince George and these are the the tiny house warriors uh, indigenous mostly female um, land warriors defenders which are again right on the Trans Mountain pipeline and as you can see here their activism involves a lot of posters and signs and art projects um, they're incredibly powerful. This is Kana House and her um, twin sister there earlier, Manuk, who are uh, daughters of um, Emmanuel, sorry, Arthur Emmanuel, who's written some really great books about, about activism across Canada. And as you can see here, this really has become their home with these tiny houses and in this landscape. Um, that they're building sort of literally with on this. So this is kind of a, a nice tie in with the residency, this idea of sort of what activism can look like, what social practice can look like. And I'm definitely sort of continuing to go back to these sites uh, and document them. And I don't know if I see these two bodies of work um, connected in any way, um, but it's definitely given me something else to, to think about um, while I've been uh, taking a break from going into the Arctic. And just these very uh, few last images here, this is, uh, everything you see here has been destroyed in the last few weeks all these trees and this forest are gone um, this is actually surveillance that the trans mountain pipeline has brought in that canadian taxpayers are actually uh, paying for and uh, they're constantly being surveilled so i'm hoping that it doesn't become um, more violent this site but i'm definitely uh watching it and you can um follow them on on social media as well i think i'll just leave it there <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you for that. And I think uh, as someone from Alberta, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's this weird, but also shameful um, territory uh, with the transatlantic, with the pipeline and trans mountain pipeline. And it's, and it's interesting. I think I, I really do see a similar um, like theme working with uh, the Arctic and with the land. I mean, 
Also, too, I think it was Don Hill. I'm pretty sure it was Don Hill who mentioned uh, he went to a film festival in Edmonton and they, they showed a, a space. It was like a documentary of the Arctic and they depicted it as um, empty wasteland. And he's like, it's not empty, right? There's so many things going on here. It's not like dead at all. And there's so many organisms and people that live there. Um, and especially with the transatlantic, uh, transatlantic, I, I have my studies in uh, transatlantic slave trade, so I keep thinking about that, sorry. But with the, the pipeline too, um, a lot of people don't know that uh, those pipeline um, companies are actually going on to um, indigenous lands and just started building it without permission. And even if they're caught, they don't ask for the rights and they continue building. But then when they come across land that is owned by settlers, then they have to go through this formal process of like talking to those land, uh, settler land owners. And it's such a stark um, disrespectful and hideous uh, conversation that's happening between there. It's uh, Wow, I just that was really a really interesting work, Tara. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, that was amazing. So many thoughts and feelings are being evoked here. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your work. I think it's at this moment of time that we're accepting um, any questions, inquiries, or like comments. Um, any sort of like conversations that came up to you during these um, artist talks and presentations, feel free to um, put them into the chat or um, unmute yourself. I have so many questions here. Uh, I guess I'm just gonna go right off the bat. I'll start first, but um, this is kind of more directed to Tara, but I was about to ask you too with um, all I consistently see media pushing out um, how they're yeah uncovering like oh new uh, you know a frozen permafrost uh, you know mammoth or saber tooth tiger and it's becoming much more um, active and it's kind of pretty scary and you coming across these sort of um, bodies to and train um, I was wondering if you can go a little bit deeper about that experience or it's the sort of feeling because <laughs> uh, it's kind of scary <laughs> I find um, but yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm going I'm going hopefully going back in in um, in March and in you could they have a whole mammoth research station there and they are they're literally in the works of, of cloning the mammoth as well as places in the States. And um, I mean, part of my PhD, I've been doing a lot of reading about de-extinction and, and what's going on with, and it, it is, it's testing on, on animals and it's not one or two animals, it's it's mass amounts of suspended animals. And um, so yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of legal and moral and it, it's, yeah, it's definitely something out of a very <laughs> violent sci-fi movie when you sort of get into it. But um, I think my work, it sort of probes at those those questions of sort of what the reality is going on and kind of opens up a space for that and presents a lot of scientific work not to kind of support it but presents it in a different way or in a different venue and so yeah so much of my work has been learning even what I'm trying to speak about and there's a lot of of things to try and understand understand and comprehend for sure. I'm working with um, Jody Castrocano, who's a critical animal studies um, researcher at, at UBC, and she's a definite powerhouse, and I've learned a lot from her, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I love Jody's work. I'm currently going through her uh, crypto menses right now. Um, and I love uh, Deirdre too. Deirdre, Deirdre, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but I love his work and she is amazing. Um, thank you for that. And it's interesting too, because um, as you go through each of your presentations, this recurring theme of land and occupying space, but like sharing space and this need to like, uh, work together, coexist, and um, share ideas. And I think there's this, uh, I, I mean, I feel bad for, I feel my heart goes to uh, the younger generation that, you know, they have this theme of like, oh, a big group of humans, you know, a single human is intelligent until there's a group of them. And I think with your residency, you definitely subvert that. Like when a group of people come together, great ideas and great inspiration and creative thoughts come out through that. And so I was just wondering um, what were the sort of themes that you've encountered that inspired each other in uh, many ways or one? <laughs> 
Maybe Leah, can you, um, I guess that's sort of directed to you because you can sure. it's, uh, it's non hierarchical, but as like one of the people who were like bringing these folks together, especially your work was very much, um, even your your dress, the sort of, I remember it as like an umbrella, like forcing, not forcing, but encouraging people to share space and touch um, was really interesting. So I feel like that played a lot into this facilitation. Well, I learned, thank you for the question. I learned so much from everyone's sharing during the residency. It was like um, Tara shared the critical and animal studies uh, reading list. And I went to the Emily Carr library and got, I think I got five books. I felt a little bad for taking so many books on the same topic, but I have a stack of these books. So that was really interesting and just learning about the Arctic and the permafrost. And yeah, just from, from everyone, uh, just looking at the, you know, sh them sharing their lens and, and looking at what they've been spending so much time intimately getting to know, um, you know, the other artists that aren't here, um, Andreas, looking at the, the effect of fires in the landscape and the experience of being in those, in those places. And um, yeah, the conversation that Annie brought up about what is our responsibility as artists in terms of the ecological impact of the materials we're using, and then the conversation that unfolded about um, how much responsibility do we have? Are we being, uh, you know, too idealistic or, or utopian if we were to create some kind of a manifesto. I think that idea came up in the first maybe hour of talk of conversation was like, what if we created a you know a manifesto of sorts? And and then I think um, that maybe that's something to return to. But but it was yeah, just just learning from from everyone's sharing was was so valuable. Uh, also, I'm, I totally want to check out what Annie just shared about. Um, the green light moving forward, the verdant luminal replacing chemicals that like all of these things I think are, um, yeah, we, we, I think we need to take the time to, uh, you know, talk together about what those deeper questions are. And I think art does that in a way, or art practice can do that in a way that, um, yeah, is, is, is valuable. I don't know if there's others want to there are others that want to speak to that. Definitely witnessing um, all of your presentations. There's like this great sense of um, shared space and touch that I think was invaluable, especially through the pandemic. Um, and that reverberated with these pieces and thinking them more deeply. Um, and I, it's really interesting too, because I was talking to Samuel about um, being a respectful, you know, considerate artist, you know, especially in a time where um, we're trying to be much more uh, climate and eco-friendly. And so my, like my experience with my art group is that uh, if you're not eco-conscious as an artist, then don't make art. And, <laughs> and I said this to him and then he was like, Michaela, he's like, as artists, you know, how much you know, work are we producing? How much, what is considered garbage? And he's like thinking about the future, right? And he's like the amount of work into it. And it's kind of really conflicting. It's a conflicting thought because sometimes artists do make junk you know like is there better sustainable ways <laughs> um <laughs> well, sure. jumping on that as you know yeah. one of the conversations that came out as about work making digital work and digital mm. work and how much space is used yeah. and, uh, to store to share to yeah. hold to be up in the cloud and then when i'm editing something <laughs> something you know so i over the last like 10, nine, 10 months, I've been trying to think of ways of treading more lightly and being more compassionate and understanding of more multi-species um, relationships in that sense, you know, and not trying to think about how, um, how I can mitigate and use less footprint, even carbon, like just, just thinking in general, how I'm digitally navigating things. And mm -hmm. as a media artist, even in this platform or others, 
just trying to think of ways to do that in a way that is meditative and consciously, um, you know, as you said, garbage. I mean, there's a lot of garbage, define garbage, you know, again, that term of somebody's garbage is treasure. But in this case, actually, there is a lot of garbage and the garbage is being is impacting and changing systems and species. And it's something that I think about a lot. And I, uh, you know, I ruminate and think and uh, yeah, I'm just trying to tread lighter. Mm, definitely. And um, like off what Tara was saying about uh, the, the scary sci fi effect of like creating like mixing with these um, encountering these beings and then trying to clone them. But then also, I think trash too is an essence of that in a weird way. And there's like good trash and then there's bad trash. Uh, what are we doing with that? Uh, I also had a question for you, Prophecy, in terms of um, your your music building. Do you like create scores? Do you record your scores or is it like improv? Like tell if you could share your process with the creation process of your- ah, That's a great <laughs> question. Oh, um, I like, to um, sample a lot of things. So I, as a, as a mother, I changed a lot of how I um, started making work seven years ago, I guess eight years ago now because my daughter just turned eight. Um, I really started re, like before I had like a much larger kind of sense of, oh, I'm gonna go to a studio, I'm gonna record this thing and you know, um, but uh, my birth of my daughter changed everything. I record everything on a small little phone. I um, work, on the fly and um, I record samples and then mix that and mix. I'm usually uh, again, sampling my voice and, uh, and then um, editing it live so that things flow and um, really using intuition and trying to, again, not to be too precious about the work that I'm making. I generally will just share in process material and that's the finished product so everything and anything that you see of mine is not something that I consider a finished it's just a part of the process of the work that I've been uh, ruminating on um, but as far as compositions um, it's a great question I think uh, I don't think I do I think things for me sound is not something that starts and stops uh, it's something that is always continuous and um if anything, it's just almost a snapshot on something that I'm thinking about or uh, something I'm composing in my mind. Um, but it's it's very intuitive and very site specific and very time based and and really in a response to a location or a space. So um, if anything, I guess in that sense, it is a composition of um, of of that site specificity and that emotion and the feelings that are um, that I'm either picking up on or pulling from from each landscape. Awesome, thank you. That's so interesting because like using your phone to record is actually quite. I find it quite gorilla. Um, it's quite punk, and uh, especially with your uh, our discussions previously about your residency, like as non hierarchical and like to have a, a non hierarchical sort of system it's very punk and it's like it is subversive and it is collective and it's social so uh, that like reducing your your recordings to your phone is quite uh well nuanced it is and it's also kind of like uh shocking me also um i think it's becoming more the norm you know uh the covid mm -hmm. uh covid has um brought people together but it's also reminded people in other ways about, um, I'm saying that, that's my perspective. Uh, in this case, as a parent, I've never been able to attend so many more things in mm -hmm. person on this platform and others, um, and be able to work um, with a mobile technology and knowing that I only have 10 minutes to make something because that's just the reality of my life. And yeah, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, Definitely mobile approaches are, I think, uh, a strategy. And I think um, not to in any way, um, I, I think for every artist and every maker, they work in different ways. For me, this has just been a, it's a way that I can continue on with my practice in a way that feels very intuitive, 
Mm -hmm. I record, edit, and generally just upload things right from here and that's it. And then I'm moving on to the next thing. So yeah, Is it, you know what, when you mentioned your motherhood and as we're like a group of uh, women, I know you had some male participants yeah. <laughs> in your in your residency that are um, not here today, unfortunately. But uh, thinking about what uh, Annie mentioned about reminding me about Canadian art, um, their magazine, I think it was the Today, they made that uh, post, uh, but around, because I remember they were going through struggles in 2020 and around that time there was actually a call to go to Carfac and ask them to actually include um, parents like mothers or fathers who have children that need to travel for exhibitions that they should include those expenses into the car fact fee and that kind of I don't know where that conversation went um, but I'm just curious about um, the folks that aren't here with us today, thinking about being parents and like thinking about adults, like being adults right now, responsible adults with the land um, and working through, even though we're living in a society that's quite gendered, um, but where is that, um, the commonality, the sublime of that experience through this micro residency? Um, you know, what's, uh, what sort of conversations were uh, Andreas bringing or Scott? I'm just very curious about that. <laughs> Maybe you want to jump in, but I was just going to say, I, I, it was my first time meeting Scott in person. And um, Scott is a parent. And so um, knowing that there were times where, for example, at one of the first day, it was like, okay, well, I have to go. I have to have dinner with my daughter and my partner. And, you know, I have to go now, or, you know, I need to take this call, you know, just having a, an understanding and a, um, yeah. So he definitely did talk about parenting a bunch, but um, also a lot about play and finding other ways of engaging in his practice that were kind of outside his wheelhouse. I think that was one of the themes that came up, at least from my conversations with Scott. I, I He was really, really engaged. And um, on the second day, Scott presented and um, we engaged in this. And you can see from the images that Leo is showing, I'm doing this because that's the, if everybody else wants to do it, it was one of the motions that we were doing. We were um, using these long strings to, um, to, to capture, he was taking photographs from the side and we were trying to, uh, three of us or two of us at the same time, try and make these motions so that you could capture a, um, a spectrum of movement and light. And, and so um, I'm totally doing Scott, I just uh, is the service, but it was really engaging and it really made me think about those avenues of play that, um, that aren't necessarily as explored in a practice. But as a parent, sometimes you just get an opportunity to play even for 10 minutes. Wow, I just saw Annie's uh, comment about the manifesto. I guess a play in parenthood should be included in that manifesto. <laughs> right? And being a parent is forever, you know, once you become a parent, you're forever a parent. And it's one of my, as a child, and I'm not a parent, but like having my parents over to watch me create or like or if I could tend to them is like the greatest experience. And that's where society kind of clashes, even though we all have parents. Um, and, you know, to make space to have dinner with your kids, with your partner, um, those are very important moments. So awesome. And, and Melanie uh, hosting the um, a, a couple of us was actually, I mm -hmm. felt very taken like care of. We ate meals together outside. We there was like this real moment of sustenance and giving regardless of like there was different types of parenting models going on and I like and caregiving and care in general and to yeah. me I think if anything I think um and Andreas um talking about the landscape and fires and notions of care and mm -hmm. um thinking of you know um just deep levels of engagement that um and time mm -hmm. Yeah, and like Melanie's work is very relational, I think, and that totally embodied what it sounds like your experience, too. And I think that's another aspect of your residency is the relationality and building and fostering um, relationship between each other in order to create work that is your goals of sustainability or um, reaching out togetherness. Um, very powerful work, for sure. Um, 
Awesome. Oh, Petrina. Yes. Um, I just just wanted you mentioned Melanie, so it was a good segue for me. I just wanted to say that whenever I hear the words activating space, I hear it in Melanie's voice. <laughs> um we've we've had the pleasure of working with with melanie at least twice before um uh with the moon under the tree uh opera picnic in the evening and uh with the third beach installation in the gallery um and you know in in all those cases melanie did exactly what she intended to in terms of activating space bringing people together connecting them um, and then I was one of the participants that got to have one of those dodecahedrons. Um, and during COVID, it, I happened to have mine for three days where I didn't hardly left the house. And I was a little disappointed with the timing that I got to have it at home and I wasn't going to drive around like the lovely video you showed. But what was really exciting was while it sat there at home, even when I took it to bed with me, like, you know, I put it next because I wanted to see if it changed. As people were moving around the area that I was static in, the lights were changing and it just made me so aware of people around me that I don't know. And it was just such a great experience. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for activating the art house because that's exactly what it's there for. Um, and we were really excited to host that. Thank you. Thanks, Petrina. And thank you so much for hosting us. Like uh, when we were talking about uh, doing this and uh, in the Okanagan and chatting with um, Annie and Leah, uh, we are thinking about different venues and uh, Lake House or Lake Country and the Art House were top of the list um, just because of that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I do notice that we are at 842. Um, that was beautiful. So maybe this will be a good time to close it off. Um, I just want to be show my thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating and our guests and our presenters. This was just amazing and sharing your knowledge. Again, very punk very punk and um, I really am excited to see where this really goes and seeing all your works and feel free to uh, let us know about your like any future projects and we're here to like endorse you and like support you so please like give us a shout and thanks again to our guests for participating us here today. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank everybody for for showing your work and explaining the artistic journeys you're on and the, your perspective behind your work. It's wonderful. Congratulations to you all. This was a wonderful oh. evening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank Very you. good. Thank you, Papa, Mama Nicholson. <laughs> I heard so many stories about you too. Actually, it was amazing. I love the stories of family around the table and hearing about other people's families and and um I, I i feel like i know both of you already even though i i have never met you and this is the first time physically i do but yes um tara is uh, amazing and there's a legacy there that is obviously being shared thank you thank you great great Thank you, uh, Empire of Dirt Residency. I've just been seeing you two at the edge and um, I hopefully get to like connect with you later. This was awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, feel free to stay if you want to continue chatting or um, uh, go if you would like, but um, we'll stick around for a little bit if there's any more questions. I guess I could probably stop the recording now. And then if you do just want to chat, sort of, yeah. Thanks, Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, Melanie, I just wanted to say there's, I mean, I had so many questions for like all of you. Um,